Welcome back to another awesome episode of the Midnight Reviews, presented here by Glasshouse Films. We're knee-deep in Friday the 13th Mania with the second in our four-part series of the storied slasher films, Friday the 13th. Now, as per usual, I must remind you that we're going knee-deep into spoilers with this film series. Huh. These things are like 30 plus years old, so if you're complaining about spoilers, that's on you, not on us. Anyway, I'm the oh-so-beautiful host, Carson, and with me as always, Allie. Enough with the introductions. Let's get out of the review. I want to talk about this thing. You know, I have to do the intro and stuff to tell people what they're watching and whatnot. You do realize that, right? They give zero fucks about that. They want to hear about Jason's escapades. Well, Friday the 13th Part 2 was filmed little more than a year after the first film was released. Friday the 13th Part 2 was also originally pitched as a film that would not be a direct sequel to the first Friday film, but was instead originally intended to be a series of films that would be a separate scary movie in their own right, according to producer Frank Mancuso. Originally, what was filmed as an in-joke for the crew, the ending where Jason pops out of the water and attacks Alice at the end of Friday the 13th Part 1, wound up being the springboard for the idea of using Jason Voorhees as the main antagonist for the rest of the Friday the 13th franchise, throwing aside the idea of an episodic film franchise with no interconnected continuity. But one has to wonder just what in the hell an episodic horror film franchise using the Friday the 13th moniker would have looked like. We're not discussing that, you distracted moron. We're talking about the movie that is. Released in 1981, almost a year to the day, audience were retreated to Friday the 13th Part 2, this time chock full of Jason Voorhees. One of the interesting tidbits about this film is that while Adrian King from the first movie does reprise her role, but is the opening kill of the film, this isn't the interesting part. What is the interesting part is that after the first movie was released, she was stalked by an obsessive fan and subsequently requested a much smaller role for this film. A role that sees her getting killed off after a tastefully edited dream sequence recapping the final few minutes of the first film. Which is a really great idea as a highlights reel of the first movie, but then watching these movies back to back, it just gets tedious. But after Alice's exponentially well edited dream and uninspired murder, the actual plot of the film begins, taking place five years after the events of the first film this time around. The group of soon to be med school cadavers are attending a counselor training program. This just so happens to be hosted around everyone's favorite team body dumping site, Crystal Lake. Which is actually a smart idea, giving the filmmakers a lot more people to have murdered on screen, thereby causing a more evenly paced film in general. True, there aren't any long stretches of the film where you're just watching one girl run around and scream for 10 minutes. This film, much like Jason himself, briskly finds a teenager, kills them, and moves right on. Because of the way the film is paced with each of its kills, it never really gets to orchestrate a symphony of dread like it did in the first one. In fact, because the film is so briskly paced, it leaves a much less memorable movie-going experience. And the lack of uneasiness isn't just prevalent in the kills of the film, but it's also the way that the film is presented. Whereas the first movie looked like they used grimy old film stock that had been dragged through the backwoods of Camp Crystal Lake itself, this film looks almost too slick and clean, stripping away the grimy feel that was so perfect for the first film. It never feels like the film is dripping with atmosphere like the first film did, and while the higher production values hurt the film when it comes to presentation, it doesn't help when looking at the actors. This time around, there is more investment with the characters as they're more clearly defined. The script itself also flows better to accommodate the faster pace, and the acting itself is far more natural. Let's actually get back to the kills for a moment. No. Wait, what? I said no. Why not? Because I want to talk about the kills. Well, okay then. So the first movie didn't exactly have the most imaginative on-screen murders. With the exception of Kevin Bacon's, of course. But 
this time around, it really did seem like the filmmakers weren't confident enough to try to kill off teens in different and more imaginative ways, and instead just copy and pasted the tried and true ways that scared people the year prior. Which is a real shame because you'd expect the filmmakers to want to try and tackle a different challenge, and really establish Jason as having a different M.O. when it comes to butchering teens. Instead, he just mimics what his mother did. The only kill that actually feels like they were taking a bit of a risk was when they killed the poor man in the wheelchair. But even that feels like the axe kill from the first movie. Shut up, the adults are talking now. But yes, you are right, many of the kills are just kind of sad repeats from the first movie. The only exception is when they killed off Crazy Ralph, which is the saddest part of the whole movie. But even that doesn't look like a kill until you see the blood running down his neck. The biggest reason why it feels like so many of the kills in this movie feel like repeats of the first film is that the studio demanded another film in less than a year. So they had less than a year to script, cast, shoot, edit, and push out this new film, so given all that, they didn't do too bad a job, though they could have benefited from an extra year's worth of work. Beyond that, the fact that the kills are so similar from the first movie to the second kind of speaks a lot about how they thought of Jason as a killer. Think of it this way. Little old Mrs. Voorhees is a tiny old lady who's really old and would have difficulties chopping up teens with a machete because she's so old. But she's an old lady. I mean, look at her. She's... Old! You can't just take her stuff, she's too old! But Jason, on the other hand, is a ten foot tall giant who can hack off limbs like they were wet paper mache, yet the kills are hardly distinguished from the first film. But glossing over the lackluster kills and the completely unengaging plot, there is one such point in the film that is still pretty memorable and for all the wrong reasons, and that is the climax of the film. The last ten minutes of the film makes approximately zero sense when even a dollop of mental willpower is spent on it. So we see the final girl run from our Herculoid killer only to stumble into Jason's stupid altar to his mother. Thinking quickly, she dons the frumpy old sweater of Mrs. Voorhees and then stalls Jason by pretending to be his mother, just long enough so that her boyfriend could come to the rescue. Which opens a whole five gallon bucket of worms right there. First off, why does Jason even have an altar with his mother's head on it? Wouldn't the coroners have collected that shit? Assuming that they were unable to collect the head for whatever reason, wouldn't the authorities have at least taken the body to a morgue instead of just leaving it on the beach to rot and blow it up? And if he had had the time to collect her sweater and head, why not just abscond her whole body for the matter? Even though the entire climax is just a giant plot hole large enough to drive a dump truck through, it's not such a bad thing because they managed to rope Betsy Palmer back in to reprise her role as Mrs. Voorhees. Always an instant win for the movie. But looking at the film as a whole, while it is a step up in terms of production values and expands on the original premise of the first film, it is hampered by so many other issues that it's, at best, kind of one of the more forgettable Friday 13th entries. It isn't until the next entry that we get to see the series really start to go off the rails a little bit, but for the most part, this film is far more bearable than the first one. But it's far more forgettable. Well, there you have it, folks. A better, if slightly less memorable, entry into the annals of Friday 13th history. Allie, why don't you tell the good people where they can find you? You can find my gaming channel located at facebook.com backslash idioticgaming2013, as well as youtube.com backslash idioticgaming2013. And here are the links for y'all. Don't forget to click on them. Her stuff's pretty rad. Now, as per usual, do not forget to subscribe to my channel as well. Go ahead and comment below if you agree, disagree, or just want to tell us how awesome we are in these videos. And uh, don't forget that uh, the channel is at www.youtube.com forward slash Glass Films House. Don't forget to also like the page on Facebook, Glass House Films, and go ahead and follow Twitter at Glass House Films. Until next time, everybody, stay tuned. Paralyzed my legs. Is it permanent?